Everybody. Welcome to Green New Theater 2020 Part 6. Y'all, we got to stop this. This will be our last call of our Green New Theater series, but we have a wrap up with the Producer Hub on February 5th at 6.30 EST as part of the Producing Ethically in 2020 Now One series. We'll drop a link to that into the chat uh, and Tara will be on that. Before we get started, uh, we just wanted to acknowledge the, you know, coup and that this week has been, in a word, stressful. So thank you for joining us today, tonight. This session is being co-facilitated by Groundwater Arts in partnership with HowlRound. We're hosting this call on Zoom and there are a couple of people here with us. We're also live streaming on HowlRound and on Facebook Live. So hello to all of you who are joining us. If you joined on the first Green New Theater uh, calls throughout the summer and fall, welcome back. And thanks for joining us again. You'll notice that a lot of the language may sound familiar, especially in the beginning. And thank you for your patience as we create radical access points for new people to join us. So let's get into it. This session will last approximately 90 minutes and we recognize digital fatigue is real. So you can feel free to leave and come back, stand up, turn your camera off, turn it on, do whatever you need to in order to take care of yourself at any point. And as a heads up, uh, so we will be in the Zoom call and we have ASL and captioning support. We hope um, that folks will participate in our discussion later because so much of what we hope to do with the Green New Theater is based on relationship building and decentralized processes. So we encourage you to participate to whatever extent you can. We're going to take a moment now to introduce ourselves as facilitators. And while we do that, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box using your name, pronouns, and any land acknowledgement you'd like to give. For those of you who are watching on HowlRound, send us an email to introduce yourself. And for those of you on Facebook, please comment. Visibilizing our access needs is a method of accountability, and I want to take a moment to highlight, amplify, and shout out Unsettling Dramaturgy, which is a colloquium of mad, crip, disabled, and indigenous dramaturgs from across Turtle Island for modeling what you all will witness us do momentarily. The link to the Unsettling Facebook page should be in the chat any moment now and in the comments as soon as uh, Tara puts them there. So I'll go first. Hello, my name is Anna Lathrop. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I live on the unceded lands of the Lenape, Lenape Nation, more specifically the Canarsie and Nyack peoples in what is colonially known as Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, between Upper New York Bay and Nyack Bay. As a visual description, I'm a white woman with blonde hair wearing an orange and gray dress. I'm sitting in front of a gradated black background going from blue to white with text on the right hand side that says groundwater arts and text on the lower left hand side that has our contact information. I might have to stretch because of a knee neck injury, but otherwise my access needs are being met. I am a futures and social services designer and co-founder of groundwater arts. I will now pass it on to Tara. Yeah, Mado, he's Jay, Tara Cho, Chief Kados. My name is Tara Moses. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a citizen of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. I'm calling in from the Muskogee Creek Reservation and the site of the 1921 burning of Black Wall Street. These lands are colonially known as Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I am one mile away from the Arkansas River. Uh, my access needs are that I may need extra time to respond as my attention is split in multiple areas, as I am monitoring the Facebook and the email and all the things. Um, 
Great, other than that, my access needs are met. My visual description is that I have brown skin, very long, very dark, blue-black hair that's pulled into a ponytail, and I am wearing gold hoop earrings and a black see-through shirt. Uh, it is see-through, I promise. You may not be able to tell, but it is. Um, and I'm sitting in front of the exact same background that Anna just described. Uh, the contact information is Groundwater Arts on Facebook and also on Instagram, groundwaterarts at gmail.com and hashtag new, green new theater. Um, I updated my institutional affiliations and I can't announce that yet. So uh, what I can announce is that I'm the producing artistic director of Tele Tulsa, co-founder of Groundwater Arts, a director and a playwright, and I will pass it to Annalisa. Well done, Tara, well done. <laughs> um, hi everybody, my name is Annalisa Diaz. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling from the traditional lands of the Pis Piscataway Nation, colonially known as Baltimore, Maryland by the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. These lands have also been cared for by the Susquehannock, Lenape, Lumbee, and many indigenous nations who are still here today. As a visual description, I'm a brown skinned woman with long black hair. Um, I'm wearing bright pink lipstick <laughs> um, and I'm sitting in front of the same background that Anna and Tara already mentioned. Uh, at this moment, my access needs are met. I'm the Director of Artistic Partnerships and Innovation at Baltimore Center Stage, co-founder of Groundwater Arts, and also an independent theater maker. And I will pass it over to Rani. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Rani Pinoy. My pronouns are she, hers. I am Laguna Pueblo and Cherokee and live on the traditional lands of the Piscataway, Pamunkey, and Anacostan people. Also known, uh, and this area is also known as Washington, DC. Uh, which is near the Potomac and Anacostia River, rivers. Um, I'm a light-skinned woman with long brown hair wearing a light blue shirt with gold dangling earrings. I'm sitting in front of the same background. We're all matching tonight. And at this moment, my access needs are met. Uh, I'm a producer at Octopus Theatricals, co-founder of Groundwater Arts, an advisor for the New England Foundation of the Arts um, National Theater Project, a co-founder of the Producer Hub, uh, and a composer as well. Uh, finally, for everyone who is not with us on this Zoom account, but uh, tuning in on HowlRound or on Facebook Live, uh, you can participate by commenting on Groundwater Arts uh, Facebook um, in the live event, or you can email us at groundwaterarts at gmail.com. Uh, that is all one word, and our email is also on our virtual backgrounds as well. Um, Tara is going to be monitoring, mo monitoring those channels tonight, dropping all links we discuss here in the Facebook comment section and vocally, vocalizing what uh, y'all are sharing either on Facebook or through email. So if you're unable to get on Facebook um, and um, uh, want the link shared, please email us and we'll send them to you. So Zoom, the platform that we are using today and many days is headquartered in what is now called San Jose, California on the traditional lands of the Ohlone and Tamian peoples. We acknowledge the lands that Zoom resides on because the work that we create together on a digital platform does not exist in an ether or an imaginary void, but it's made possible because of the physical land and the indigenous people who steward it. And I'll pass it to Annalisa to talk about Groundwater Arts and who we are. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Groundwater Arts shapes, stewards, and seeds a just future through creative practice, consultation, and community building. For us, climate justice is defined as racial justice, economic justice, and a decolonized future. Uh, that is all one word, and our email is also on our virtual background. Oh, hold on. Excuse me. As Annalisa figures out what's going on, um, I, I will just jump in for the next little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so this call in particular is the last in the series of six Green New Theater calls that have been spanning roughly nine months. Um, for those of you that have joined us for more than one call, as you already know, they're intentionally spaced out. So everyone has the ability to opt in and opt out as their personal bandwidth permits. And because deep change requires the capaciousness of time and care. So we hope that over the course of these calls, we as a field will feel more equipped 
to move toward justice, both at an individual and institutional levels as we look to rebuild. I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Annalisa, who looks like it's all <laughs> yeah, good. I haven't exactly figured out what happened, but I have roughly 37 tabs open at the same time. So I think that there was something in there, but we seem to be good now. Um, the Green New Theater document itself, for those of you who have not yet seen it, it was created in collaboration with a wide array of perspectives that center Black, Indigenous, people of color, and disabled people as those are the folks who are on the front lines of climate change and have been leading climate justice movements for decades. The document itself models community accountability and you can read all of the names of the wonderful people who volunteered their time and expertise to the document. Each call of this series has modeled a different principle of the Green New Theater. And the document consists of six principles. They are community accountability, decolonized leadership practices, pu publicly transparent budgeting, right relationship to land and history, sustainable resources, and immediate divestment from fossil fuels. Our call today will be centered on the principle of immediate divestment from fossil fuels. And we will post a full link to the document in the chat now in case you haven't seen it, you can take a look. And it's already there. So uh, to kick us off, we'd like to offer this passage from Robin Wall Kimmer's Braiding Sweetgrass as a grounding for our conversation tonight. So I am going to read a section from Honorable Harvest. You can also follow along on the PowerPoint. The Honorable Harvest does not ask us to photosynthesize. It does not say don't take, but offers inspiration and a model for what we should take. It's not so much a list of do nots, but uh, as a list of do's. Do eat food that is honorably harvest and celebrate every mouthful. Do use technologies that minimize harm. Do take what is given. This philosophy guides not only our taking of food, but also any taking of the gifts of Mother Earth air, water, and the literal body of the earth, the rocks and soil and fossil fuels. Taking coal buried deep in the earth for which we must inflict irreparable damage violates every precept of the code. By no stretch of the imagination is coal given to us. We have to wound the land and water to gouge it from mother earth. What if a coal, a coal company planning mountaintop removal in the ancient folds of the Appalachians were compelled by law to take only that which is given? Don't you long to hand them the laminated card and announce that the rules have changed? It doesn't mean that we can't consume the energy we need, but it does mean that we honorably take only what is given. The wind blows every day, every day the sun shines, every day the waves roll against the shore and the earth is warm below us. We can understand these renewable sources of energy as given to us since they are the sources that have powered life on the planet for as long as there's been a planet. We need not destroy the earth to make use of them. Solar, wind, geothermal and tidal energy the so-called clean energy, harvests when they are wisely uh, used seem to me to be consistent with the ancient rules of the honorable harvest. Uh, and the code might ask of any harvest, including energy, that our purpose be worthy of the harvest. Oren's deer made moccasins and fed three families. What will we use our energy for? Thank you so much, Tara. Uh, so we're going to move uh, into a little bit more of a free-formed conversation for about 25 minutes um, and then open the floor up if folks have uh, questions um, and to talk a little bit more. Um, and we're going to try to speak at a speed that our captioners and interpreters can catch up with. But if we are speaking too quickly, please let us know. <laughs> Um, and before we get started, we have an awesome two minute video from Go Fossil Free that lays a great groundwork for just transition and what we're going to be talking about today. Here's how we avert a worsening climate crisis and build a renewable and fair society together and fast. It's not about changing light bulbs or expecting your elected officials to lead. It's about you taking action right now, where you have the most power, your very own community. We, the people, have to take down the fossil fuel industry if we want to replace it with renewable energy for all. 
The fossil fuel industry has spent decades creating and denying a climate crisis that is already affecting millions of us around the world. So how do we take down the most powerful industry in the history of the world? It's quite simple, actually, by building enough local people power. Fossil fuel companies only have the power that we are willing to give them. They are supported by our public institutions, giving them social acceptability through sponsorships and partnerships. Our very own investments, allowing them to expand into new fossil fuel projects that are completely unnecessary. Our politicians, allowing them to operate and pollute within our very own communities. But look what happens if enough people are pushing against those very pillars of support. What if communities all over the world stand up for themselves and say, no more fossil fuel projects, not here, not anywhere. If we pass local bans and organize ourselves to resist fossil fuel projects in our very communities, not if anymore for dirty energy. If our universities, museums, pension funds divest from fossil fuels and refuse their tainted sponsorships. Now imagine how much more quickly those pillars of support will fall if we are accelerating a just and fair transition to 100% renewable energy for all. If we're actively promoting the kind of community controlled and just alternatives you want to see. Awesome. So thank you for sharing the video. Um, I dropped the link to the full video and Go Fossil Free's amazing website in the chat and on the Facebook. Uh, so feel free to check it out there and watch the whole thing. It goes into case studies. It's very dope. Anyway, and so um, what is really awesome about that video is um, it gives a, an example um, of like a just transition and what that can look like. And um, Annalisa, <laughs> I'm going to throw it over to you um, as our like resident uh, queen just transition. <laughs> Just kidding. We all love it. Anyway. Oh, you want? Uh, you mean like what even is a just transition? In a yeah, nutshell? yeah, yeah. In a nutshell, you're very good at nutshells. Okay, I'm gonna try a nutshell. It's uh, but but like disclaimer: nutshelling a just transition is a little hard because it's a framework that's been developed for over 30 years by many many people. Um, so there's a lot of nuance that I'm going to ignore for right now. But Tara, can you do you have a link to the movement generation just transition zine? Or can someone throw that in the chat? Yes, that's what I was doing right now. Awesome, and that's so great. So if you want the like, uh, one of the best examples that I've seen or the best explanations that I've seen, check out that link. But the nutshell version is that, so we need to move from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, full stop. Like that is a, that's a given. Um, so currently the whole global system is set up um, as an extractive economy, which basically means that um, industries are taking resources like coal and fossil fuels and, you know, people and, you know, turning people into capital as well. But right now I'm focusing on fossil fuels. Um, so we are extracting resources from the earth and turning those into uh, wealth. Um, and we need to not do that and, ch and change our entire global economy into a regenerative economy. So if that's the sort of like, we must do that. The question is, how do we how do we go from one to the other? How do we transition from extractive to regenerative? And then inside of that transition, there's a lot that we a lot of choices we could make as a global um, community. And the the just piece of it is how do we make those decisions um, in a way that is driving justice and not reinscribing all of the injustices that currently exist. So there's a real opportunity inside of this transition from extractive to regenerative, actually to bring our global systems into alignment. Um, and like spoiler alert, most of the most of the ways to do that are like getting behind indigenous people um, and centering indigenous sovereignty and black liberation 
um, because these are, and centering the people who have been on the front lines of climate change for 500 years, which again are in black and indigenous folks. Um, so th that's sort of the nutshell version of it, but there's a lot more to dig into in that movement generation, just transition zine. Did I do it? Yes, I think you did. <laughs> well, and I guess I'm curious, um, and maybe um, either one of you can do it or I can do it, we'll see. Um, but the, the notion of going fossil free in the arts, you know, I think that there's a number of folks and probably if you're listening to us talk, then you're, you're probably a little further ahead of the curve in terms of um, maybe feeling like we should be divesting from fossil fuels. So, you know, there's a case to be made that, you know, of why we need to move from an extractive to regenerative economy and that we need to go fossil uh, free. But then there's the whole, uh, you know, the whole issue of how. And I think that, you know, the what Annalisa shared and what the, um, uh, you know, the video we just watched shared was like a little bit of how to do that. Um, but in the arts specifically, I mean, something that I'll just say that I noticed is this sense of, um, I'll just say the thing, um, like I kind of infantilizing of like, well, we're just here in the arts, what can we do? And we can do a lot and we can do a lot more than writing climate justice plays, which while like not to um, diminish that that has a place, there's so much we can do in terms of our advocacy and in terms of modeling, not just what happens on the stage, but everywhere else. Um, Turtle Island slash the United States is uh, really behind where a lot of other um, countries are and their arts institutions are in terms of divesting from fossil fuels. Um, major museums are starting this. And I mean, maybe, um, you know, feel free team to jump in, but this might be a, a nice time to chat social license to operate. Why, yes, indeed, the social license to operate. <laughs> One of my favorite things to talk about. Um, but before I do, because I already talked a lot, does anybody else wanna take a shot at this? Let's, since I have the slide up, let's just explain what social license to operate is. Yeah. Um, so what's written on the slide is the idea that a business or industry that is causing harm to everyone including employees and everything, including the planet, are allowed to operate because society has given them an implicit pass. This happens when industries position themselves as contributing to social good through reputation laundering, like investing in arts institutions and other charities. This gives them an outward appearance of doing good when in fact they are directly responsible for harm. So, um yeah, and what I'll add to that is just to go back to the two minute video that we just shared the there was a visual in it that was the sort of fossil fuel companies as the uh, like sitting on top of several pillars and the pill some of the pillars were universities, museums, pension funds, banks. Um, and so the, the sort of like museums and arts institutions pillar is, is one of the pillars that is upholding the fossil fuel industry. Um, and the, so the, the sort of like question before us is, can we knock that pillar down or can we start to chip away at it such that that would contribute to dismantling the ability of the, the entire fossil fuel industry to operate? Um, and just to put a finer point on it, what we're talking about um, is things like um, taking corporate spot both there's two things here there's taking corporate sponsorships from things like BP Chevron or other fossil fuel companies um, so sponsoring company when we take sponsorships from them and put them all over our institutions our the public good that arts institutions provide is then associated with BP or associated with Chevron and it's like oh Maybe those companies aren't that bad because they're funding, you know, the Tate Museum in London or they're funding whomever they're funding. Um, so sponsorships is one thing to divest from. And then for the arts institutions that are big enough to have endowments, like real question, where are those funds invested? And a lot of the times they are invested in the fossil fuel industry. So we are many times endowments are literally making money from fossil fuels like we are also invested in, in profits 
Um, so if we start to be really critical about pulling money into more socially responsible funds, then that too can crack away at that pillar that's upholding the entire industry. Yeah, and also folks may be thinking, okay, cool, I understand from like an organizational perspective, like what we can do, like community uh, pooled capital, uh, capital, you know, um, divesting naturally, like uh, from, um, with our endowments, as well as just like not asking money <laughs> from these corporations and, uh, you know, like actual fossil fuel companies. That's a big thing where I'm from here in Oklahoma, uh, specifically here in Tulsa, the quote unquote oil capital of the world. Um, you can't throw like there is I. Mm, I can't even think of besides my own organization that doesn't accept any sort of fossil fuel money. Um, and so with that, there is a lot of this like scarcity mindset. And so um, Step one, obviously, is that's not true. The scarcity mindset was put into place, so mainly to keep BIPOC people from, you know, getting the money and stuff. Anyway, but there's other strategies. But um, what can you do on the individual level is uh, a huge question, especially for individual artists. And um, a really quick anecdote that I'll share. Um, for the job I was supposed to, I accidentally almost announced that I wasn't supposed to at the beginning. Um, when I was interviewing for that le senior leadership position um, at a 30 year old, 30 plus year old organization, um, I said in my final interview that if you want me, which spoiler, they did, then we are going to seriously evaluate where we get our money from. If we are getting money from the Doris Duke Foundation, as an example, who made their money from oil and gas, as well as genocide and displacement of the indigenous people of Hawaii, then we are not going to get it from them anymore. We're not going to do it. Um, just straight up told the board that in my last uh, interview. Now here's the thing, could they have said, no, we're not gonna do this, we're not gonna hire this person? Absolutely. And if they did that, then I don't wanna work there anyway. Um, so really leading forward with your values in these interview processes, especially when these big institutions want you as an individual artist. And spoiler, y'all, I got hired. And spoiler, meet with the finance committee next week and we gonna have a fun time in that conversation. Um, and so like there is a lot of individual power that we do hold, especially when these predominantly white institutions see us for who we are, especially for, my organization is not a predominantly white institution, but just as an example. Anyway, see us for who we are with all these quote unquote like call, um, qualifiers, what we bring to the table, how we help diversify their organization. We have a lot of power there. Um, so just a quick antidote, like tell them what's what in the interview and if they hire you, then they gotta do it. That's the rules. I wanna go back, yeah, I wanna go back to something you mentioned at the very beginning, Tara, where you talked about community pooled capital, because I think that you know, it's a it's a scary time for theaters right now. We can acknowledge that. There's a that's true, uh, especially you know institutions. People been unemployed for over a year now for some, and you know there's a big question of like, well, if I don't take money from them, where do I get the money to do the things? And um, you know there are so many, so many alternative economic models that are already out there, a lot of, most of which, the ones that are anti-racist and the ones that are uh, regenerative are happening in BIPOC communities, are happening in mutual aid communities, are happening sort of on these fringes of, uh, you know, what you know, like these economic models. And one of which, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, um, Ronnie, if you would like to speak to a very concrete example that is happening right now. Sure, my pleasure. Um, so in addition to wearing my hat as a co-founder of Groundwater Arts, I'm also one of the founding members of the Industry Standard Group. Um, and I'm happy to um, drop a little link in the chat for that. Um, that particular page has a lot of um, uh, breakdown about the group. So. This was a really um, an effort in the commercial sector of all places um, in the arts field, looking at, okay, there's, we know that there aren't very many um, BIPOC producers um, in the commercial space. They're just not, there's a handful. 
Um, and there's a huge barrier to entry because typically you need to be able to invest um, at a very high level and you need to be able, you need to be um, uh, kind of given a, a particular stamp of approval that you make so much money and that you understand that whatever money you're giving, you might not get back. So the threshold is you might need to have like your net worth be like a million dollars before you can really invest in Broadway. And as we know, you know, systemic in inequities are such that that's a pretty high bar to have to jump. Um, and moreover, in the arts field at large, there's a real hunger um, to really support um, BIPOC artists and arts workers at every level. So um, the founding members of um, TISG, in particular, um, Rob Lackey, um, Adam Hinman, um, um, yeah, in particular, those two um, folks um, put really looked at community fund models, kind of what Anna was talking about um, in creating the industry standard. So in short, um, the industry standard group is a um, it's like a commercial fund. So basically, any anybody can give to the fund philanthropically, and only BIPOC people can invest. And what it means to invest, it starts at the low level of fifteen hundred dollars which you put into the fund for X amount of time and you get uh, a percentage, a small percentage. You're not looking at like, you know, Hamilton money getting back, but it's a pretty sure bet that you're gonna get X amount of percentage back from the money that you put in. And with all of that um, income, what it means is that the, the TISG fund that has a, um, the goal is to really get a mil you know, million dollars in investments, you know, and then that can really be put towards um, investing in BIPOC artists who wouldn't have, you know, let's say like white heteronormative Broadway producers or theater owners wanting to support their endeavor. And then all of a sudden BIPOC folk have a seat at the table in a different way. And that's, you know, the power of that was not in, um, how can I say this? Of course, like work of changing hearts and minds goes on. But what I love about what TISG is doing is it's basically saying, great, we're going to learn from uh, amazing folks in the field, from community funds elsewhere, and we're going to build an infrastructure that that gives us uh, a seat at the, um, it gives a seat at the table, and it also creates an entirely new platform for producers, for um, folks to learn about the commercial industry. It can be um, for um, projects that are looking for investment, they can come to the Industry Standard Fund. So it's it's really by using this model, so many different um, positive possibilities have kind of exploded out of it. Um, and it's you know, and it's something that has a proven track record. It's something that is um, uh, that you know, eight people, none of whom this is their full time job, were able to put together during the pandemic. So, you know, it's something that when you look around at alternatives, they're there, they're just not as obvious and that's by design. You know, like the system is not broken. The system is working exactly that part, as it was Ronnie, designed. Wait, that part though. Yeah. The thing about it's by design and they're not, it's not obvious by design. Yep. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's you say that the industry standard it's having a new seat at the table, but I think it's actually much better. It's in entirely different table. That's like doing yeah. cooler things in a different room. And, mm -hmm. and I love that because I think, you know, in my own observation, theater, especially theater institutions, uh, predominantly white institutions like to say that they're at the forefront of innovation and that the arts are where culture happens and that is at the, the forefront of everything. But actually theaters are very stuck. They're very stuck in old models. We create art in very stuck ways. And there are, and have always been people who have been marginalized and pushed out of the center intentionally who are doing much more interesting things that are sustainable and that are regenerative, that are funded without the need to take money from fossil fuels and are, are doing it so much better. Like, why are we not learning from those people instead of, I mean, speaking as someone who is white, 
why are predominantly white institutions not learning from people like that and supporting people who are doing more interesting work and finding new ways to find funding? Why, why is there this assumption that a major predominantly white institution has things figured out? Because white supremacy? Well, yes. Um, can I just name a thing too that I'm hearing, which uh, I love and which is also in the movement generation just transition guide. I'm like really pimping this movement transition movement generation guide. Um, the what I'm hearing you all talk about is that while we divest from the bad, we must also invest in the good, which is a strategy for a just transition not only do we have to knock the pillar that the pillars down that are holding up the fossil fuel industries, once we've broken all of that down, we need to invest in, you know, the regenerative models that we actually want in the world. And what I hear Ronnie talking about is, um, you know, people who are actually building that infrastructure for investment in ways of working that are regenerative and that do center the IPOC communities and artists. So I just want to name that um, it's what, what I think what groundwater is interested in is not just divestment and divestment and like take all the money away. It's like, cool, but once we take the money away, where, like, what are we, where are we putting it? You know, the, a two pronged approach. I can stop sharing this slide. I just wanted to share. We have, we have a slide for this, everyone, of course. <laughs> Feel very, very, uh, excited about this. I mean, and, you know, I'll also just say going back to something Tara said about um, her putting her, um, her values forward in the rooms and places of power that she's privy to. I mean, I was reminded by someone like in a, at the under the radar conference symposium that someone had written, well, the, the tricky thing about all of this is that there are so many folks for whom the only job they can get in town is working you know, for the fossil fuel company and like, what, how can we expect them to, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, that's the thing. That's one of the reasons why it's important for Tara to do what she did, for me to do, you know, the same thing. But those of us who have choice, who have the agency that we do, because you can't make someone choose between working for a fossil fuel company and feeding their children. You can't. So those of us who are in a position um, what privilege we have, we have to use it. And it's powerful. I would also say to that too, that the, the choice of the false choice of work at a job that is harmful to you and your family and don't feed your children is a false choice. Right. And, and like part of the just transition again is if we dismantle the fossil fuel industry, yeah, there are a bunch of people, like people work in those industries and families are sustained by those industries. So then the question is, where do they go? What jobs can we create that are regenerative? What is the, what are the arts institutions? Like, can, can we be a part of that? Um, I, like I have questions about, um, uh, it, for example, in the DC Baltimore sort of ec theater ecology, we often are like at a gap for our backstage tech crew and, and scenic crew and these kinds of skilled workers that I'm, I'm a little bit like, hello, if we are shutting down fossil fuel industries, guess where there's a bunch of skilled workers. And not that all of them are gonna wanna come and work backstage, but you, you take my meaning that like thinking about it in a different way, like what are the different um, ways that the arts institutions could contribute to a just transition and it's, um, there, there are many different ways that we could. Um. And so with that, it's really related. Um, MD dropped a question on Facebook and it was asking if we could explain more about the scarcity mindset. And you know, what Ronnie and Annalisa just brought up is exactly that. So the scarcity mindset is the belief, a belief that was taught that there will never be enough and so that results in fear, stress, anxiety, resource hoarding. Um, in the case of where I am in Oklahoma, that results in, well, we don't really like fossil fuels, but these are the folks who are supporting us. So where else are we going to get it? 
Um, on the other hand, in what the dress transition is about, and also like what reality is about, is the mindset of abundance. And what that means is, is that there is more than enough for everyone. And that comes out of a very deep like sense of personal worth and security, community accountability, and it's grounded deep within our communities, within the people as well as with the land itself. And the, and the last thing that I'll say about this, about like, where, where does this come from? You know, I joke all the time, the roots of all evil comes from Europe. I promise it's a joke, I promise it's a joke. <laughs> No need to, I do not mean to offend an entire continent. Um, but with that, what I do mean is, is that scarcity mindset was brought to the Americas from European colonizers. Because previously, or as I like to say, going back to our indigenous roots, capital I indigenous, not just indigenous roots of these lands, but indigenous people, your roots from across the world, um, is the scarcity mindset never existed. It was always a mindset of abundance, that your community and that the earth itself will take care of you if you take care of it. Um, and what also what I love about changing our mindset to an abundance mindset is, is that that is when we can start to think about things like the industry standard. That's when we can start to think about um, pooling community capital. Like that's when we can start to think about um, like smaller grassroots organizations and investments um, is, is that we can really open up our mindset outside of what we've been taught there only is and only for a certain amount of people um, and really truly see the entire forest of abundance that's waiting for a reciprocal relationship. Um, a relationship that is also based on actual relations, which I can get into that to another time. Anyway, um, and the last thing I'll say about there is um, as we're like grappling with those doubts, we can point to scores and scores of organizations, not just in the United States, but across the globe, which have returned back to their own indigenous roots and this um, mindset of abundance and are thriving. There are theaters here in the United States who have chosen to resist the like scarcity mindsets as well as these like white supremacist standards of who gets what, when, and why. Um, and they're thriving. They're doing just fine, y'all. So I promise we are not inventing any wheels. There, lots of them exist. <laughs> um, so I hope that answers your question there. And I just dropped into the chat and Tara, I dropped it on Facebook already. Um, I love it. In response to MD, this question about scarcity and abundance. Um, there's a, a podcast, which is also a, an article in Emergence Magazine that is by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who also wrote Breeding Sweetgrass, which Tara just read an excerpt from earlier. Um, this, it's a podcast on the service berry and economies of abundance. Um, and I won't go into it because Tara basically covered everything, some like most of the main points that um, Robin Wall Kimmerer makes in this podcast, but it just MD, if you're interested in it, it's just really lovely and hopeful and wonderful. So please take a look. And also a highlight from Facebook, um, Claudia Alec has been sharing, dropping all kinds of wisdom. Um, so just to vo vocalize that, number one, when you're inside anti-racist economic ecologies, you don't have to support racist choices because of financial precarity. What? Yes, yes, true. <laughs> Our strength is investing in these new models. Claudia adds the economic structures of the American theater are designed to keep most inside them in deficit. Exactly. How you want to control people? Make them poor. We all, we don't do that. All right. Claudia continues on. Supremacy culture works on a mythology that it is the only option. If we must invest in the health, we we must invest in healthy alternatives. And supremacy culture keeps folks in the conditions of a word I can't pronounce um, to create false competition. Um, Claudia is very, very smart. Check out Calling Up Justice, wonderful YouTube channel too. Um, Austerity is the word. Thank you, You're thank welcome. you. <laughs> yeah, so just highlighting that up from the Facebook chat. I just want to also open it up for those of us, you know, those who have joined us in Zoom and anyone who also has questions we're going until 8.30, so you know, please jump in if you have questions or, or if you have 
something you want to add, an example from your life? I mean, these are all brilliant people, so I believe in all of you. One thing that while we were sort of waiting for people to um, have questions to, to share, um, one thing I wanted to mention was um, Tara just sort of shared a story earlier about her own personal individual advocacy um, with relationship to a specific, like a job offer. Um, and I, I'm like, how do I share this story? I have a similar story that had a, the opposite outcome, <laughs> um, which is that I had a, and I think it's, I just wanna, I wanna name that it's important to share all, like to share our struggles um, and so that we no, don't feel like we're doing it alone. Um, but I had, I, as a playwright, I had a play at a theater and it was a play about, um, war and like legacies of colonial violence, <laughs> shocking, um, <laughs> on brand. Um, but it, it was, it dealt with the sort of the Guantanamo Bay prison complex. Um, and the theater that was producing the play was accepting funding from war profiteers, like literal people who were we weapons manufacturers. Um, and so I tried to have a conversation with the, the sort of head producers at the theater and it did not go well. Um, in fact, I was uh, sort of told I would be blacklisted for even bringing up the conversation um, and uh, was advised by folks there not to talk to anybody about it. And, and like, I would be sort of thought of as hard to work with and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I, I share that to say like, I did it because as a playwright, I was like, hmm, I have the opportunity here to just have a dialogue with the theater. Um, and even if in that particular instance, I didn't have success um, in getting them to change their funding um, for my project, uh, I have to imagine that that conversation was having ripple effects beyond my, my um, sort of being there for that one singular production. Um, so, I don't count it as a, a failure, um, but in it, you know, <laughs> just because I didn't get uh, achieve my goal in that conversation, um, and one of the things that that sort of goes along with individual advocacy, part part of the the strategy around divestment is visibilizing the wins because when we do have wins, um, that actually visibilizing that puts pressure on peer institutions to get on board. So like Tara having a win and naming that out loud um, puts pressure on other peer institutions to be like, oh wait, Tara got this institution to agree, then like maybe this other theater should also divest from fossil fuels or maybe they should consider eliminating their sponsorships from the Doris Duke uh, Foundation. Um, so celebrating the wins that we do have when we have them, even if they're infrequent, um, the more we can celebrate them, the more frequent they'll become. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that, you know, for folks who are thinking about, huh, I wonder where I can hear about other wins or more of this, um, more of these conversations. Um, there's a great article that I'm going to drop, um, in the chat here, if Terry, you don't mind also sharing it um, on Facebook. It's a few years old, but what I love about it is it really in very clear, um, in very clear language explains the systematic divestment of fossil fuels that's happening with art museums specifically in the UK um, and, and what museums in the US are really dragging their feet. And it, it kind of arms me with the sense of you know, other folks have proven that it can be done. You know, it's a, um, it is doable. You know, it is not the impossible. So I, you know, I really, um, I think in any climate spaces that we're in, as much as we can kind of say, okay, what is your success story? You know, where have you been having these conversations? I mean, I also think Annalisa that if another artist comes in and says, it makes the same ask, and then a third artist comes in and makes that ask, that also matters. You know, that's right. That's right. Um, so it's important that we keep talking about this. And with that, not just talking about, oh, isn't this a problem? And, 
isn't that so hard and maybe I should build um, anyway. I don't mean to be, um, I'm like pivoting a second. I don't, there's a sense I think in the arts field that our ability to make change is limited to um, building in um, uh, into our budget the, oh my God, what is the word I'm looking for about buying carbon? Oh, carbon. thank you. Ooh, words. Um, and that's not it. There's so much more that we can do. That's so far from it. That's so far from it. I can't even, like, it's so far from it. And I think that we're seeing a moment right now of in divesting from lots of things, right? Like divesting from uh, violence in like hierarchical relationships in the workplace, Div trying, attempting to divest from racism, attempting to divest, like we're seeing a movement and there's sort of an acknowledgement of that. What I'm trying to say is there is no money that is not political and where you choose to get your money from is, in a, is a reflection of your values. So when you take money from war profiteers, when you take money from, let's say the Sackler family, when you take money from Exxon and Chevron, you're participating in those systems in a very tangible way. And you can say, and you can put in your program, you can take money from Chevron and put a play up about climate change. But what has materially occurred here is that you are allowing Chevron to continue to exist while putting up a play that says, no, 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 that's bad. There's a hypocrisy there that I think is untenable in our institutions and in our own art, our own creative practices that we just like, we can't, <laughs> y'all, we can't, we gotta stop it. I also want to take this moment for anyone who is with us in the Zoom room right now, uh, which we see you anyway. Uh, if you would like to turn on your cameras and engage in the conversation, feel free. If you would rather drop things in the chat, feel free. Um, I mean, you know, we can talk all day long. However, um, something else that we're really talking about today, like, is looking towards all of the knowledge and wisdom and experience within the community. Um, and so, as we said earlier, we never position ourselves as experts on anything other than our own lives. And even then, it's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> at that. Um, anyway, so if there's anything that anyone wants to share, any questions, any experiences, any moments of success, any moments of failure, um, now is your time, y'all. Again, to highlight Claudia um, on Facebook, it's recuperation. They said when it. I was going to say, Sarah, while we're waiting for um, more uh, sharing and questions, I'm wondering if you can talk about how divesting is anti-racist. Oh, I would love nothing more. All right. <laughs> well, as we know right now, the theater is at a pivotal time and has been in a pivotal time for a hot damn minute. Um, so precursor, it's been a pivotal time for decades, um, but especially in the last, um, I don't know, year, um, with movements such as the We See You movement, uh, with all these theaters finally deciding they should be anti-racist for once in their lives, you know, uh, actually being able to have these conversations, kind of. Anyway, it's a time. And so I'm a huge fan of, <laughs> this is a lot about me, anyway, of seeing what cards I have on the table and figuring out what I can, for lack of better words, uh, weaponize for good in those cards on the table. So as an example, whenever I was in, you know, back to that example earlier, in this final interview round, I already knew that they wanted me real, real bad. And so that is the card I had on the table that I was then able to weaponize for good to say, you want me, we ain't gonna have Doris. It's me or Doris, you choose. <laughs> And then we went from there. Um, and so with that, another thing that we have on the table right now is how much pressure predominantly white institutions especially are under to do anti-racism work. So another card we got in our deck is that divesting from fossil fuels is anti-racist. Now, first and foremost, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, we like we don't need to go into, but we know what the fossil fuel industry has done to vulnerable 
communities along the coast, um, along the Gulf, in predominantly Black and Indigenous and people of color communities. Um, we don't know, we don't even go into it. Anyway, um, but some other examples about how divesting from fossil fuels and really breaking down that pillar um, further as an ant like further as anti-racism um, i'll give you two really quick examples the first one um is last july uh the supreme court case the mcgirt case uh was one and so that recognized the muskogee Creek reservation as an example re-established indian country um re-established these reservations and nations which is a huge tribal sovereignty win um especially for the tribes here in eastern oklahoma including two of my own anyway um as a result of that, um, the EPA decided that they could now dump waste from oil and gas on native lands because these are now different nations that don't have to follow, you know, federal guidelines. Um, and so they are purposefully poisoning the land and the water of native people who just got some of their sovereignty, not all of it, literally a smidgen of it finally recognized um, because they're racist and they hate natives because we're on their land. We're on their land, so they think. Anyway, um, and this also dates back to like the beginning, like the turn into the 20th century uh, with the Osage Nation and like y'all Google the Osage murders, not that damn book written by that white man, don't do that. Look at Charles Redcorn's book, he, it's better and more accurate. Anyway, um, but literally murdering native people when they realized that there was oil on their lands. Um, and also right now, as we speak, the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma is in, in um the pro is in a lawsuit um that is issuing um these invoices to oil and gas industries and taxes uh for being on our lands and not paying up and the governor who's terrible and uh the attorney general who's also terrible are both um got their panties in a twist because <laughs> If the Seminole Nation wins, which, fun fact, we will, because tribal sovereignty and the GERT is on our side, um, then this sets up a very scary precedent for oil and gas that they can no longer just mine what they want willy-nilly without huge financial repercussions towards the indigenous communities that make it completely unsustainable for oil and gas to make money. Like, hello? <laughs> So we're talking about divestment, being anti-racist. There's all of these examples of how that upholds that. Um, Anti-racist ideologies. But also, furthermore, like, what can you do? Oh, I don't know, donate to Seminole Nation Legal Fund. You know, get the word out. Share. <laughs> Share about those things. Petition your like non-native representatives um, to support this lawsuit in case. Because, like, yo, it's my land. Can't take what's on it without my permission. Um, and if something like the court case of the Seminole Nation succeeds, and then all of the court cases that will come afterward, what that means is that oil and gas is going to fall. They're going to be weak. Anyway, I'm sorry. Now I'm just going off. I'm just very excited about it. <laughs> um, but those are just some really brief, hopefully brief, examples about how divesting is anti-racist. Does anything have anything to add? Um, I, yeah, so I'm wondering, Annalisa, if you want to quickly define sacrifice zones, and then uh, Claire has dropped a question in the chat that we can talk about. Yeah, I, um, when you were talking, Tara, about the, the sort of communities along the coasts who have been abandoned, um, and how they are predominantly Black and Indigenous and um, other communities of color, there's a term out in the world that you can Google, which is sacrifice zones. Um, and it's used in many different contexts, um, but the, the sort of general idea is that there are geographic zones that are thought of as sacrificial because, you know, in order to make profit, climate is the climate is changing. Um, and so sea levels are rising. And so uh, ge geographies predominantly along the coast um, are sort of sacrificed to the rising seas. We also see sacrifice zones um, in uh, what are predominantly black and brown communities where there are um, industrial treatment plants in cities all across the country and across the world. Um, 
I know there are there are places. I think I think it's in uh, I want to say New Orleans that there's a whole neighborhood that's basically called Cancer Alley, and I think that there's also a, or maybe that might be Houston, um, but. No, it's Baltimore. all Indiana. You're right. Yeah, and in in Baltimore, there's a giant trash incinerator, um, and it's to no surprise that the community, the neighborhoods where people are living, right around that incinerator, are all predominantly black, and therefore the the um, smoke that is the noxious gases that are coming out of that incinerator are concentrated in black communities. Um, so that is having health impact, negative health impacts. Um, and driving up inequity, um, inequities in, in health disparities as well. Mm -hmm. um, Claire had asked, I'd love to hear more examples of other economic models. The company I'm a part of uses the free theater movement to build funds from community donations of any amount rather than charge for tickets. And uh, Ronnie has dropped a link of 10 models of community investment funds. I just also want to add that there are several there there's lots right and it all depends on what you want to do in order and how your community operates and how enmeshed you are within that community um but some just some examples off the top of my head and this is actually part of my research which might become part of groundwater's research um there's there's things like bartering there's things like credit clearing there's things like time banking all of these sort of are economic models that don't require money like fiat state backed cash. There's also lots of different options um, that, you know, sort of uh, don't necessarily require things like co ops, right? Things like uh, community learning exchange, which uh, was developed in Germany, things like community development financial institutions, you know, there's a lot of different sort of options. I'm actually gonna drop a link in the chat. This is a piece that's still in progress, but it's a series of cards. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in grad school for design, so therefore I have to make cards. Otherwise I'm not a real designer. Uh, and it's a series of cards that outline a whole bunch of different kind of economic models. So I'm just gonna go ahead and drop that link in the chat. Um, and Tara, if you wanna drop that on Facebook as well, that's totally fine. Um, but they're just sort of different examples of what all kinds of uh, economic models are out there. Um, and then Shireen also asked a question. Uh, I'm wondering about what happens to the Doris Duke Foundation money. What could a just transition look like for them or a restorative or transformative justice process? What could they do to address their harm better with the funds they have? Um, I'm going to turn it to Annalise and Tara right after I say there's nothing keeping them from reparations and just keeping the money back. And now I'll turn it over. I mean, that's what I was going to say. Give you money back. <laughs> I mean, the yeah. Doris Duke Foundation especially has caused so much harm, like harm that cannot be undone to the indigenous people of Hawaii. Give the money back. Hey, Lisa. Yes, I mean, you know, I echo that. Um, and a resource for thinking about how to actually do that and convince funders um, to do things like that is Decolonizing Wealth um, by Edgar Villanueva. And like one of the sort of strategies is actually to, to move funders to, uh, that have histories of accumulating their wealth from extractive industries, which is, you know, most foundations, um, but is to actually just have them spend down their their corpus. Um, and so there, there's like a federal law, I think it's through the IRS or whatever it is that's governing funders, I assume it's the IRS, that, that says that foundations must spend, I think it's, they're mandated to spend four to 5% of their corpus every year so that so the uh, that is like what sets their budget but there's nothing that says they can't spend more than that um so the sort of restorative transformative way to think about what to do with wealth that has been accumulated because of genocide um is to just spend it down and give it back and and um there are many people who have been thinking about exactly this. And, and so Tara and Anna just sort of said it glibly. Um, but I, I, wanna, I just wanna say that like, yes, 
Um, and it's, it is easier than you might think. Um, or I guess it's not easier than you might think, but like there are people in the foundation world who are having these conversations. And the more that we can do to push those conversations to the forefront um, in whatever relationships that we have with funders, whatever position we have throughout the field, um, the better, because that's another way to knock at those pillars that are holding up the fossil fuel industry. Yeah, I think there's a false belief that companies and foundations need to live forever, um, but they don't. And there's no reason why these foundations shouldn't just literally give all the money back and then close forever. It's fine. I think I'm also a huge proponent of wealth redistribution within your own institution. If you have the ability, and I fully recognize that not all of us do, but if you have the ability to change the salaries within your organization, so that we were artistic directors aren't making 500, 600, 700 percent more than the lowest paid person in their organization. Do it. It just occurred to me this is a little bit of a different subject, um, but I wanted to bring it up in case it is in case it um, uh, provokes something for any of y'all. Which is what we've been talking about thus far is mostly about um, pushing institutions to divest their money or to not take sponsorships. And I'm thinking about the folks who might be listening who are like, but I don't work at an institution. I'm an independent artist or like I work in a small collective and like we already made commitments not to take fossil fuels. It's that it's not with our values. So like, how can we contribute? Um, another thing that we do as theater artists is tell stories and shape narratives. Um, and we could put our narrative making skills to use in, in um, building movements. So when I, and when I say that, I mean like there are all of these organizations like 350.org and the People's Climate Movement and, 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 and all of these different orgs that are out there pushing for a just transition. Um, and they have a lot of folks that are graphic designers. They have a lot of folks that are musicians. There are not a lot of theater people that are like actively um, working on uh, visibilizing and, and movement building toward a just transition. And we could put our theatrical skills to use um, in movement building, not just in the arts, but in uh, dramatizing the struggle. Um, like there are, when we're sort of protesting and doing direct actions, there are theatrical ways of doing protest and theatrical ways of doing direct action that we could get involved in, that your theater collective could participate in, that your theater collective could plan. Like go to your local Just Transition org or go to your local um, BIPOC run um, justice movement organization and like get involved with them and be like, I'm a theater person and I have X, Y, Z skills that I could bring to the next direct action, direct action that you plan. I mean, and also furthermore to um, theaters, like we private, we pride ourselves on our partnerships. Um, there exist worlds <laughs> where, um, whenever we have like talkbacks after productions, um, whenever we have our marketing list that we send out emails to about our upcoming productions or whatever, that we can also share resources, events happening in the community, inviting folks to come in to speak to people during our talkbacks, um, during our pre-shows, to our staffs, I mean, but to our audiences especially. I mean, they are a captive audience. They're in, they're there. <laughs> Um, but I mean, to also think really um, largely about our like partnerships and our programming and what we do with our partners. Um, I mean, something as simple as just folks coming in to give a 20 minute presentation can ignite a couple folks in the audience who are then going to go to their networks um, and share all of that information, who would then go to their networks and share all that information. And so, I mean, is this a just transition, like small as all? Is that from there? I, we say it all the time. I never remember where it comes from. That's Adrienne Murray Brown. That's emergent strategy. It's there not, it is. You're not wrong, though. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's all wrapped up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, every small action um, does, does something good. 
Um, so there is no small, there is no small, you know what they say, there are no small roles, only small actors, or whatever you want to say. Anyway, every little, every little piece, um, really does contribute to the movement. And by every little piece, we don't mean every little water bottle, we mean, <laughs> although yes, don't use plastic, but, um, just to reiterate that so much of this is that systems change. Uh, we have a lot of agency, a lot more agency than we think. Um, and it's not all tied to, well, I have a crappy uh, representative who's never gonna change, so then what do I do? I mean, there's so many ways to push this forward and so many um, efforts, many of them BIPOC just transition um, efforts that, you know, I feel like Annalisa outlined a really great way to, to show up and say, I have these skills, what can I do? Also, one last thing I'll offer that I just thought about um, is like, let's look to Georgia right now and all of the voter suppression that was happening in the state of Georgia and frankly happening in all of these red states. I mean, get me started, Oklahoma. Anyway, um, that is a wonderful movement and model to look to for guidance for how your theater can do the same around organizing against fossil fuels, around moving towards a dress transition, around moving towards a green new theater, um, is also like broadening her, our horizons to not just look within like a theater, uh, the theater world or the arts world, but all of these movements who have done what folks thought were the impossible. They made it happen, y'all, I mean, Tickety talk, look at our Senate. <laughs> Things are changing. Anyway, um, and so bringing that up that there are leaders like Stacey Abrams and all the folks who are on the ground in Georgia um, who like also love the arts, who'd be really great people to talk to, to learn from, uh, and so many, so many resources, especially since we're just coming off of an election that we can look towards. Yeah. So I think that's a wrap up for tonight. Thank you to all of you for taking the time and making space to be with us and with each other today. A huge thank you to our friends at HowlRound for their support during this chapter and all of Green New Theater 2020. A huge thanks to our uh, ASL interpreters and our captioners for today. It takes an entire village to make this series happen and we're very, very grateful. Uh, we also just wanted to mention, we'd love a pre uh, feedback from any of y'all. Our goal with these calls is to create a low stress, generative space for relationship building and connection across the field about what a green new theater could look like. So if you have a moment to email us at groundwaterarts at gmail.com with any feedback on the format of the session, you know, what worked for you, what didn't, what you think we could do better, uh, or what you'd love to sort of experience in the future, let us know. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is please join us February 5th at 6.30 Eastern New York time for our Green New Theater wrap up session with the Producer Hub. Really looking forward to it. This whole call series has been a, a labor of love. And so we're excited to celebrate it. Um, and just thank you to all of you. If you'd like to stay in touch, you can email us at groundwaterarts at gmail.com um, or Follow us on Instagram or Facebook. And so now Tara with the music. More like Tara's gonna stall for a second because I closed that tab because I forgot we were gonna go there again. So here's my stalling, isn't it great? And we're waving and saying thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you.